Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read a couple of verses beginning in verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Father, as we search this passage further today, having begun to look at it last week, this kingdom preview, we pray once again that you will enlighten us, that you will be our teacher, that perhaps in a new way today we will see your glory and your greatness. Help us not to miss what it is that you're saying. Lord, help it to change our lives. We pray this day will be honoring to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John, uh, John Newton, most of you probably are familiar with the name, was a slave trader for many years, a very profane man. Kind of unbelievable things happened in his life early on. Later, the Lord got a hold of him, transformed his life. He became a preacher of the gospel in, I think it was Olford, England, I want to say. I don't know if I've got the city correct, but... And he became the author of Amazing Grace, so you know him from that, if from nothing else. In his later years, in his old age, he used to sometimes lose track of kind of where he was. Sometimes that would happen mid-sermon. I know the feeling. Um, then he would say, at that point in time, I have lost my train of thought, but I know this. I know that I am a great sinner but I know that Jesus is a great Savior. I'll tell you, if you can get that theology into your mind, you've got all that you need. But you need both ends of that. You need to understand how our standing before God shows us to be a great sinner, even the best of us, and that we all need a great Savior. There's nothing more important in life than to know the greatness of Jesus. And that's what this passage is about. Now, last week, we began to look at it, and we looked at the purpose for this kingdom preview. We saw that it is a kingdom preview. We saw that Jesus had just in the verse before, in all three Gospels, said that there will be some who will not see death until they see the kingdom of God. And Peter, James, and John were those who were privileged to have this opportunity. It's this kingdom preview. And we saw the purpose for that preview was to encourage both the disciples and Jesus. God has here, the Father has rolled back the curtain so that the next age, what's to come later, is breaking into this age for a moment in time. And they are seeing what's to come. And the message to them is it's going to be worth it. There's great cost coming. It's going to be a great price to pay both for the disciples as well as for Jesus, but God is assuring them it will be worth it in the end. So that's the purpose of the preview. Now today and next week, we want to look at the person of the preview. This is really the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of this passage. It's the heart of the Bible, the person of the preview. We're going to look today at the supremacy of his person. We'll look next week at the sufficiency of his passion this is the person and the work of Christ that we see here in this passage. So today, the supremacy of his person. In April of 1995, San Francisco hosted a big party. It was a retirement party for quarterback Joe Montana after 16 years in pro football. The uh, kind of outsized announcer that we all know and love, John Madden, showed up for the occasion and basically declared Joe Montana the greatest quarterback who ever put on a uniform. And as he did that, a fan yelled out, Joe, we love you. We love you, Joe. Well, that was a little too much for Bill Walsh, who had been Joe Montana's coach for most of those years at San Francisco. So he stood up and he said, you know what? 
That's not what you guys were saying in 1979 when we brought Joe Montana in here. At that point in time, you were wondering why we drafted this guy that looked pretty much like a Swedish place kicker. He's just a small guy, you know? He looked like anything but a pro football player. And yet over the next 16 years with his quick step, his very cool demeanor, and perhaps most of all his precision accuracy in Bill Walsh's West Coast offense, he turned the 49ers into the dominant team of the 80s. Just to give you a flavor of the way he operated, one of the Super Bowls that they were in, San Francisco was down by six points with under two minutes to play. They got the ball back on their own eight-yard line. So Montana came out, he got the, got the guys all huddled up, and then he pointed to the stands and he says, hey, isn't that Joe, John Candy sitting over there? Which, in fact, it was. So they all had a big laugh, got loose, and he drove them 92 yards for a touchdown to win the game. One of four Super Bowls that he won, highlighting his greatness. But beloved, that greatness is nothing compared to the ultimate greatness of the person of Jesus Christ. For 33 years, this planet Earth hosted the supreme being who ever lived. It's hard to imagine what it was like that this carpenter from Galilee, this place that would be that would be not even thought of except for the fact that he was there, that he could be so great. And like Montana, nobody looked at him and thought what a great person he was. He didn't look like much. I think we all have this exalted picture of the physical appearance of Christ. But Isaiah 53 verse 2 tells us this. It says, He had no form or majesty that we should look on him, no beauty that we should desire him. I don't think you would have looked at Jesus walking down the street and said, wow, there goes the greatest guy that ever lived. It, it wouldn't have happened. Now, once you'd been in his presence for a while, everything would hopefully change, but he didn't look like what he really was, the greatest person who ever lived. Preeminent in his manhood, preeminent in his, in his majesty, and preeminent in his message. And that's what we want to look at this morning. First of all, his manhood. Jesus was a man. The disciples knew Jesus was a man. Some people have missed this. But these guys had seen him walk and talk and sleep Eat, drink, sweat, tire, tan. You know, they knew when he took his sandals off, the tan lines were there, right? He was a man. They'd seen him blister and bleed and laugh and weep. Max Lucado says it this way. Listen to this. It says he felt weak. He grew weary. He was afraid of failure. He was susceptible to wooing women. He got colds, burped, suffered. How you doing so far? You hanging with me? He suffered. To think of Jesus in such a light is, well, it almost seems irreverent, doesn't it? It's much easier to keep the humanity out of the incarnation. Pretend that he never snored or blew his nose or hit his thumb with a hammer. There's something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant and packaged and predictable. But don't do it. Don't let him be as human as he intended to be, for only if we let him in can he pull us out. I hope you get that. It's critical to understand the humanity of Christ. He was as human as it gets. But beloved, that doesn't mean he was normal. He was anything but normal, right? Normal people don't take their disciples up on the mountain and suddenly light up like a Christmas tree. He was anything but normal. And look who he hangs with. Verse 30, behold, two men were talking to him. That sounds okay, right? And then, <laughs> then he names them, Moses and Elijah. And of course, we all know those were guys that lived hundreds of years before this. They were long gone from the scene by this time, and yet here sits Jesus with two of the greatest men in Jewish history. Moses the deliverer, the great deliverer and lawgiver, and Elijah the great prophet. 
You know, to get a feel for this, it's kind of like going to a retreat or something up at Estes Park, right? And all of a sudden you get up there and there sits Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. That's what this is like for the disciples to wake up and find this going on. It's incredible. Now the question then becomes, well, why are they there? And we looked at some of the reasons last week. We know that they were certainly there to affirm that when Jesus said he was talking about the kingdom of God, he wasn't kidding. This is where they came from. But why these two? You know, why not Daniel or David or Abraham or uh, one of the other great Old Testament saints, Isaiah or somebody else. Why these two? And I want to concentrate on that for just a moment. I think there are several reasons why this was Moses and Elijah. First of all, both of those men had very distinct departures from this life. Moses, as you'll recall, had sinned. And so God said, you're not, you can't go into the promised land. And so as the time came near when the Israelites were going to enter Canaan, Moses went up to the mountain, and the Bible tells us this in Deuteronomy 34. It says, his eye was undimmed. He was 120 years old, but his eye was undimmed, his vigor unabated. And he just went up there and died. And then it tells us that God himself buried him. So his departure was a bit out of the ordinary, but it was nothing compared to Elijah's. 2 Kings 2 tells us about Elijah's. It says, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the Two of them, Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went by a whirlwind into heaven. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? But the departure of those two contrasts very distinctly with the departure which Jesus was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Because we know that that's a reference to the cross to which he was going. It's going to be a very different departure that he was going to experience. And it was on their behalf as well as on ours, that he was going to experience that. The second reason that I think these guys were here is Moses and Elijah represent, if you think about it, they represent really the two great parts of the Old Testament. Moses is the great representative and writer of, under God's inspiration, the law in the Old Testament. Elijah is a great prophet. Together, together, they represent the Old Testament that Jesus has come to fulfill. He's come to finish the job, if you will. He tells us in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Many people are very confused on that point. I think the Old Testament was done away with. We're now just in the New Testament. Listen, the Old Testament was just as real and just as, as, as necessary as ever. It's just that Jesus became the fulfillment of that. What Moses and Elijah started, Jesus is here to finish. He's here to fulfill. But I think there's even more. Moses, as you will remember, led Israel's exodus out of Egypt around 1450. BC, and it's, that's, that's intended in the Bible because it's used over and over for this purpose, to be the great picture, it's the great picture of our salvation. What does salvation mean? One of the ways we first become acquainted with it is by understanding what the, what the escape, what the exodus from Egypt was all about. So Moses is a backward look at how we enter the kingdom of God. On the other hand, Elijah is a forward look at the kingdom of God. You say, where do you get that? He, he lived before Christ as well, and that's true, he did. But if you were to look at the next to the last verse in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter four and verse five, here's what we would find. God says there, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So what God has promised is that before the time of the coming of Christ, the end time, something yet future to us, Elijah will be on the scene. So he is directing us forward in the kingdom of God. Now I want you to turn with me to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, chapter 11. Because we see here one other hint of who these guys are and what they are and why they may be here on this mountain. In Revelation 11, God through the apostle John is describing 
the end time events that are tied up in the time that's called by various names in the Bible, the, the time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, a lot of, a lot of names given to the last seven years of history before Christ comes. It's the last of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, and so Revelation is all about that. And here we are in Revelation 11, kind of in the middle of this time, and God sends two great witnesses to earth, witnesses who come from heaven. They are there to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's still being preached, even at that point in time, amidst great chaos that's going on in the earth. And he says in Revelation chapter 11 now, verse three, it says, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, that's three and a half years in biblical terms where it uses 30 day months. They will prophesy for this 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So he describes, and then he goes on to describe in the next few verses their miraculous protection. Although the world is going to want to be able to get rid of them, they're not going to be able to because they're protected by God. And then in verse 6 we have this. It says, they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Anybody remember what we've heard that before in the Bible? If you remember, that's exactly what Elijah did during the, t during the time of King Ahab. He went to Ahab one day and said, hey, king, guess what? It's not going to rain anymore until I say so, and I'm not talking, and he left. And three and a half years later, he came back and said, it's, it's going to rain. Three and a half years, just exactly as we have here. Sounds a lot like Elijah, doesn't it? And then, continuing in verse 6, and it says, And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire. What does that sound like? Well, that's exactly what Moses did in the, during, the, during the time before Pharaoh would let the people out of Egypt, right? And so what we have here is these two witnesses who sound a lot like Elijah and Moses that come from heaven. They are eventually killed, but they lie in the streets for three and a half days to the great joy of some of the earthly crowds. And then God raises them again as one last invitation, one last call, one last demonstration of his desire that no one perish, but that all come to repentance. And then they're gone. Now, they're never named, but the pattern suggests that these are Moses and Elijah. And I think that that's who they will be at that time. And I think they're doing the same thing that they're doing on this mountain of transfiguration. They're here to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the coming of the kingdom of God, the same thing that they're going to be doing during the time of the tribulation. These men are witnesses to what God is all about. Now they are, that makes them great men, does it not? And yet as great as these men are, they're not even close to the greatest person who is on that mountain. Glory is emanating from the person of Jesus Christ, not from Moses and not from Elijah. And notice in verse 31, we're back in Luke 9, by the way. Sorry about that. Notice in verse 30, 31 what they're talking about. Luke 9, verse 31, it says they're talking of his departure, Jesus' departure, which he is about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They're not talking about the great exploits of the past that they've been involved in. They're not talking about the great exploits of the future that perhaps they are going to be involved in according to Revelation 11. But what are they talking about? They're talking about the exploits of Jesus Christ. Because even these two men, as great as they are, as we saw last week, are in heaven at that point in time on credit. Their sins have not been forgiven. They're there on credit They've had faith in God, but their sins can't be forgiven until Jesus dies to pay the penalty for their sins. God has extended credit to them because they've believed in him. But until Jesus dies, they don't have a right to be there, and that's what's about to happen. They need Jesus as great as they are. Notice later in verse 36, look at this. When the voice had spoken, this is the voice of God that comes later. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. As the night ends, beloved, on this mountain, 
There's nobody standing anymore except Jesus Christ. I don't think there's a greater picture in history other than the picture of Jesus on the cross that shows us Jesus as the dividing point of history. He's the only one who can fulfill all that was prophesied and all that the law requires, all that Moses and Elijah represent. They're gone. They can't fulfill. They can only tell us what's coming. They can only tell us what the requirements are. Jesus is the only one who can fulfill the requirements. Jesus is the only one who can stand alone now as the one who is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the only one who can fulfill all that they represent. And so there he stands alone at the end of this day. That's why it breaks my heart every time I hear somebody talk, well, like a, take a great man like Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was attracted to Christianity. You just, you just want to go back there and almost grab him by the lapels he was working in South Africa as a young lawyer in his early days, and he wrote this in 1894. He said, I could accept Jesus as a martyr and the embodiment of sacrifice and the divine teacher. How many people accept him that way? But not as the most perfect man ever born. His death on the cross was a great example to the world, but there is... There was any, but, but that there was anything like a mysterious and miraculous virtue in it, my heart could never accept. You know, my question is, how could you miss the greatness of Jesus? If you've really examined the scriptures, how could you miss that this was a man like no other that ever lived? Theologian J.C. Ryle said it this way. He said, Moses and Elijah were the king's servants, but Jesus was the king's son. Moses and Elijah were planets, but Jesus is the son S-U-N. They were witnesses, but he is the truth. It was Jesus' as a, Jesus preeminence as a man that, that made him able to die, to take away the sins of the world. Had he been anything but a man, he couldn't have done that. As God, he could not die. As the God-man, he could Second thing we see here is the, is preeminent, the preeminence of his majesty. He's preeminent in his majesty. He is a man, yes, but he is also more, so much more. He is God. This is the heart of the passage. Jesus is much, much more than humble humanity. He's God in the flesh. He's man, yes, but he's God of very God. Can't take him as just one or the other. You must take him as both. Look at verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. I mean, imagine the astonishment at that scene. I said before I'd really kind of studied this out, began to understand what all was going on, there was just one of the most bizarre scenes in the Bible, I thought. When you begin to understand what it is, it makes perfect sense. It's a preview of what's coming. But standing alone in this world, it looks kind of crazy. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 2, Matthew describes it this way. It says, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Mark describes the same thing. In Mark 9, verse 2, he says, his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on, on earth could bleach them. So in the dark of this night, Jesus glows like an atomic reactor, his person and his clothing and everything around him. Matthew and Mark both say that he was transfigured. The Greek word metamorpho, we get our English word metamorphosis from that, right? So what they're saying is there was this, this inner being is being revealed here. It's like the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, right? And what, what the picture is here is that the caterpillar, perhaps represented by the, by the, by the humanity of Christ, is suddenly torn away to, so that we see the the inner being of the deity of Christ, the butterfly of the deity of Christ. He's been transfigured before them. Blazing display of glory here. Revealing the person of Christ, who he really is. Now, Jesse read this morning from Exodus how Moses had a glimpse of the glory of God as well. 
And the Bible tells us, Exodus 34, verse 9, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God when he came down from the mountain. His face glowed. And that happened for a few days before it faded. But beloved, that was reflected glory, right? That was glory that came from God, that is initiated with God, that was inherent in God. Jesus shines with the glory that comes from within. The glory that's radiating from Jesus is not a reflected glory. It's re revealing who he really is. It's his own glory, dramatically. Demonstrating his deity. The glory that's been veiled behind his humanity that he divested when he came to earth is shining through at this point in time. Remember how Paul tells us in Philippians 2.7 that he came taking the form of a servant being born in likeness of men and behind that likeness, the glory of God was, 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 was hidden. Here the veil is lifted briefly. It's the divine nature that lies dormant beneath his human existence is revealed. But it's the infinite value and the infinite person of the deity of Christ that allowed him, think about this now, that allowed him to die for and to pay for the sins of more than one person. If he's just a man and that's all he is, even if he could affect a substitutionary atonement, it couldn't be for anything more than one person. But as the infinite nature of God is also part of who he is, he can die to pay for the sins of the world. And so in this brief shining moment here on earth, he's revealed in an explosion of glory as the God whom he is beneath it all. Supreme in the universe and supreme in history. There's never been anybody like Jesus. You can't begin to compare him with someone else. That's why all these comments about what a great prophet he was and what a great man he was are so bogus. It's not even to be compared to somebody else. As soon as you can find somebody who lights up like that when his humanity is removed, you let me know. Now, after this short preview, his glory is once again veiled, right? But not for long. Not for long. If you turn to John chapter 17, just the next book over, 17th chapter of John, as Jesus prays the night before he's crucified, he prays this in uh, verses 4 and 5. He says, I glorified you, that is his Father to whom he is praying, obviously, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So he knows he's coming to the end. And he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Listen, the glory that Peter, uh, that, uh, uh, Peter and John and James saw on that mountain wasn't glory that just came into being at that point in time. This was glory that had existed before time began. It was the glory that... Jesus, God the Son, shared with God the Father before there was ever anything. It had no beginning. It has no end. It was, put under, it was put under wraps for 33 years, except for this one moment in time. It's always been there. Glory's always been there. And now it's been hidden for these 33 years. But as soon as Jesus was crucified and then rose again, the glory was back. And beloved, the glory is back today. The glory is back. That's why we can sing with such great assurance about the holiness of God and the glory of God. And Jesus is there sharing all of this because he is God. And listen, listen, what the disciples saw on the mountain, we're all going to see who are part of the kingdom of God. This is only for believers. So anyone that's still rejecting Christ, anyone that's still saying, I'm going to run my own life, I don't need God, Anyone who's saying, I don't even believe in God, anybody who's saying, I'm not sure, this is not for you. But for those who are believers, who have committed their life by an act of their will and a submission of their will to God, here's what we're told in Revelation 21, verse 23. It says, and the city, it's the new Jerusalem, it's another word for heaven. Heaven has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? The same Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that 
John identified in John 1.29, it's Jesus Christ. He's going to light all of our eternity. Isn't that amazing? And that's what these guys are getting a preview of here on this mountain of transfiguration. The Lamb of God. It's what makes comments like this one from a false prophet named Cephalo Dollar. Some of you may know him, but sorry, he's a, he's a false prophet. He says this about Jesus. He doesn't believe in the deity of Christ. He says, somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And we see Jesus sleep in the back of a boat. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. If he, Jesus, came as God and he got tired, says he sat down by the well because he was tired, boy, we're in trouble. Well, I agree he's in trouble, but it's not because Jesus isn't God, it's because Jesus is God. And what this man is failing to recognize is that Jesus lived with human limitations for that 33 years on purpose so that he could die for the sins of the world. He didn't for one moment, though, erase the deity that was inherent in him. He's the God-man. And belief in the deity of Christ is at the heart of the gospel. John says it this way in 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess, that Jesus, confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. What he's saying is, listen, if you're denying that Jesus is fully God and fully man, you're in deep water. You're not of Christ, you're of Antichrist. Mary Magdalene in the, in the uh, what is it? I don't know what you call it, rock something, Jesus Christ superstar, that thing. She sings. She sings. She says, he is a man. He's just a man. Well, she got the first phrase right. He's a man. But he's not just a man, beloved. He's so much more than that. He's God in the flesh. And we either accept him or reject him as that. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, the doctrine of Christ's divinity seems to me not something stuck on which you can unstick, but something that peeps out at every point so that you would have to unravel the whole web. What he means is the whole of the gospel, the whole of the Bible. You have to unwrap the whole thing to get rid of the deity of Christ. Salvation hinges on taking all of Jesus, both God and man, we have to see him in his majesty. One other thing I see here is the preeminence of his message. Preeminence of his message. He had the message of salvation. It's in its, in its simplest form. It's really simple. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You can't do it on your own. You can't make it on your own. You can only come by faith in me. Look how it plays out on this mountaintop. Verse 32, now Peter and those who were with him were very heavy with sleep. It's kind of like a nighttime occurrence every time there was a prayer meeting for these guys, right? But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we were here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then the key phrase, not knowing what he said, he's not thinking very clearly here. He's just opening his mouth because that's what Peter does. And whatever comes out, comes out. And of course, it makes no sense. What he's trying to do is extend this wonderful glory on the mountaintop. Who wouldn't want to do that? But if you think about it, how, sens you know, how senseless is this? These guys are about to go back to heaven to be with the Father. And Peter said, I'll make, you, I'll make you a tent over here if you just stick around for a while. Why would you do that? reaction, however. Look at verse 34. It says, and he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. We saw it's the Shekinah glory last week. It's the visible presence of God the Father. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud as they should have been. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. In other words, 
You know, the Father is saying, Peter, stuff it. I want you to listen to Christ. I want you to listen to Jesus. Now, before we run off, because we know about Jesus and we know about the gospel, and we've had this all of our lives, think back for a moment if you didn't know anything. But think about who's on this mountaintop. There's Elijah who once went up against 400 prophets of Baal, called down fire out of heaven. I mean, that guy was, you know, right at the top of the list of people who could have access to God and do great things, right? Raise somebody from the dead at one point in time. There's Moses who authored the first five books of the Old Testament. There's Peter, who's going to write two epistles on his own and is the, everybody agrees pretty much, is the, is the uh, it's, it's his autobiography, essentially, that Mark pens for the Gospel of Mark. There's John, who writes five books in the New Testament. And with all that firepower on that mountain, what does the Father say? Listen to Jesus. The Bible is very clear on how we need to listen to Jesus. Have you listened Really listen to Jesus. It's a matter of eternal life and death, beloved. Listen, turn to John 7. I don't know where you're at if you're in John, whatever, turn to 17. Go just back to John 7. At one point in his ministry, the chief priests, the Pharisees, sent a delegation to detain Jesus. So in John 7, it says in verse, uh, let's start in verse 44. Some of them wanted to arrest him but no one laid hands on him. You ever notice how they can't touch him until God ordains that it's the time? They wanted to, but they couldn't. Doesn't even tell us why, but they couldn't do it. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to him, why did you not bring him? And the officer said, you don't understand. No one ever spoke like this man. The authority of which Jesus spoke is often mentioned in the Bible and if you want to know why, just go back to verse 16 of John 7 and watch this. John 7, verse 16, Jesus says this, my teaching is not mine. It's not mine, but it's his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, and if you're seeking any other will, you're going toward destruction. I don't care who you are or how much you think you know or how wise you may be. Your will will end in destruction. The only will that has life is the will of God. He says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. No wonder the Father said, listen to him. He's saying the words of God. His whole life, the book of Hebrews tells us, I think Jesse quoted it this morning, is the revelation of God to us. He is God's communication. And when you look at Jesus in the Gospels, think about this. Imagine for just a moment that you're going up against the smartest people in, in your universe to debate the Gospel or to debate your faith. Imagine that you're doing that day after day after day after day. How would you do I confess right off the bat, day one, I'm sure I'd be down the drain. They'd have me on some point that I didn't have an answer for right away. But do you realize that was the daily occurrence of Jesus? The, we, 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 we kind of put the scribes and Pharisees in this, you know, kind of, well, what a dumb bunch of guys those were. Listen, these were the brightest people in Palestine. These weren't their do wells. These are men who who knew the Old Testament a lot better than you and I know the Old Testament. These were men who knew their Bible. These were men who knew their theology. These were people who were wise in human wisdom. And yet, every time they trapped, tried to trap Jesus, what happened? That carpenter from Nazareth won every single time. They could never catch him out. And the kinds of things he said were unbelievable. Someone has said this, I think it was Tim Keller, I don't remember, but somebody said this, no one has ever yet discovered a word that Jesus ought to have said. He got it right every single time. You read the accounts, I mean, you try to come up with better lines. You know, put yourself in Jesus' place as somebody comes up and challenges him and say, what would you say? And then go look at what Jesus said. 
and see if you can come up with something better. Again, someone said that, that, if we were, that, that if someone had just made all of this up, as our liberal theologians want to tell us, if somebody just made this up, we'd be sitting here having this discussion. We'd be saying, who is this incredible person who made this up? He'd be as, as good as what we believe Jesus to be. If he could make it up, who could possibly be this wise and discerning all the time on the spur of the moment? Only Jesus. Why? Because he had the message of eternal life. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Not because he has the truth. He is the truth. When Jesus hit a crisis in his ministry in John 6, if you're in John 7, you can just turn back a page. John 6, you know, the, this is where they feeds the 5,000. They come back to him. It says in verse 66, after this, after he told them, you've got to believe in me. It says in verse 66 of John 6, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They got the message. Those few got the message. The question is, have we gotten the message that Jesus has the message of eternal life? He's preeminent in his message. It's the only message that can save. There is no other message. There is no other way. There is no other person who can save us. Only this one. And, and here's, what, here's what the Bible says about the words of Christ. John 12. Listen to this. John 12. This is, if you haven't seen this passage, you need to understand it. John 12, verse 48 John 12, verse 48. It's Jesus speaking again. He says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. It, it, you know what? It comes down to this. Jesus is preeminent in his message because he spoke the words of God. And we either accept the message that says you're a sinner and you're lost and you can't save yourself and the only thing you can do is throw yourself on my mercy, we either accept that message and repent and turn and begin a lifestyle toward God or on the day of judgment, it will be the words of God that we've rejected, that were the words of Jesus that we've rejected, which will become our judge. And may I say, if you're here today, The Father will say to you, were you there that Sunday, July 27, 2014? Did you hear the word? Did you accept it? Or did you reject it again? Did you turn it down again? Did you say I'm good enough again? It's a matter of life and death, beloved. Whether we accept the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your person, preeminence of your manhood, of your majesty as God and of your message. There is no other message. There's no other way. There is no other savior. There's no other possibility for eternal life than to come to you. We could take the greatest life that ever was, Father, and it would not come close to meeting the glory of God. That's, that's what that verse means in Romans 3.23. So we, we, we tend to honor people as we will Paul, for example, on Tuesday. And it's great that Paul was a good man and a faithful man, but we believe he's in heaven today, not because he was good and not because, not because he was great, but because you were good and you were great and you died for him and he accepted your righteousness in his place. It's humbling to do that. We want to earn our own way. Help us to learn that we cannot and throw ourselves on your mercy like that publican who said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you for coming. Thank you for displaying your glory on that mountain, letting those men see it so that we could see it as well. 
Lord, help us as we sing now. I come to the cross. Lord, help us not to come and turn away rejecting. Help us to come with full and acceptant and open and repentant hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.